Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for turning out tonight. We are very happy to see you to come and participate in this Philosopharian experience uh, brought to you by Seth Titchener, the philosophy guru at Clatsop Community College. Um, as you know, in 2011, Clatsop was decimated in terms of faculty <laughs> and classes offered. I laugh about it because <laughs> I lived through it. But uh, it left kind of an indelible mark on the school that, that we've been kind of struggling to replace. And a couple years ago, in walked Seth Titchener and almost single-handedly kind of changed the whole way we all in the arts and letters department operated at Clatsop Community College because he brought with him one of the most amazing senses of people, his expertise and his passion for his topic was something that I think was contagious and really rejuvenated kind of a sad or struggling group of people. And I am lucky enough to have an office next to Seth and it is a constant stream of philosophy. And I think it is one of the most inspiring places to be on campus. And he has worked extremely hard and extremely diligently to bring himself and his perspective to Astoria and to Clatsop Community College. And I think that we are very lucky tonight to have the presentation, How Real is Make Believe, by the incredible Seth Titchener. Won't you welcome Seth Titchener? You know, remind me to uh, have you do more introductions for me. Probably get a deal on drinks just with having you introduce me. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here and to have you here to be part of this. Um, I want to give some thanks to the college, Clatsop Community College. As you, Deke was just mentioning, you know, it's, it's been through some very hard times in the past several years. And yet, what we have here, I believe, is a school that is truly a community college. It is a college of and for the community. It does things in the community and for the benefit of the community, and that is a pretty rare thing. And I would also like to thank, in the spirit of community, Fort George. You know, think about what we're doing here. We've got a group of people who have come here tonight to drink beer, to have a little pizza, and to talk about philosophy. Life is good. And this is provided by Fort George Brewery. They make a place for community. If you want to thank them, one of the best ways to do that is, if you haven't done it already, go get yourself a drink. Have a little pizza. I, myself, enjoy the nachos verde. It's very nice. you know. But have some of these things. Do this. It's, it's a great way to support all this stuff. So thank you. All right. So how real is make-believe? Well, the way that I began doing this, preparing for this, the way I try to do for many of these things, is I go around and I try to ask some of my friends and some of the people in the community about what they think about this. So I ask them, how real do you think make-believe is? Just sitting down. And I was, I guess I was both surprised and not surprised at once to hear people say, ah, it's pretty real. It's pretty real. Um, and they would give me examples of, of how make-believe was real within their lives. But then I would ask, well, okay, I, I get that. I see, I see what you're talking about with this. But um, why exactly is it real? Like, what's, what makes it real? And they didn't really know. And then if I asked, well, okay, fine. When you say you mean it's real in your life, what do you what do you mean? It was kind of a funny thing. They didn't know about that either. They couldn't they couldn't really answer. And people would go, oh gosh, you know, it seems so real, and yet I I don't even know quite what I mean. 
Well, this, I suppose, is in fact quite natural. And I think it's natural because of what make-believe is um, and how it works. It is through make-believe that we come to know what the real is, I will say. Um, make-believe is real, then, because we need it to deal with reality. What is it that makes make-believe real? Make-believe is real, and we come to discover it as real, as we need it to deal with reality. There, there's your answer. Drop the mic. We're done. Um, I say something like that, and I would just assume that there would be an objection to it, pretty strong objection to it, right? And the objection, objection, yes. Um, the objection would be, how could you, how could this be? How could you say something like this, right? Make-believe is a deliberate construction. It's something that we make up in our mind, as the name suggests. And what's more, we make it up, this is a philosophical term for you, we make it up counterfactually, counterfactually. That is to say, with our minds, when we make believe, what do we do? We take things that are against what we ordinarily know or believe that we know, right, to be real, and then begin to reconstrue them in a particular way that is set against this. Now, if that's the case, if that's what we're doing, how could it be that we come to know what the real is through make-believe. It seems to be absolutely against this. And that's a, that's a good response. That's a natural thing. Seems like we need to drop the mic again. I mean, it just, it's one of those things where you wonder, what, what does this mean? Um, and it would, in some ways, almost seem to end the argument. It might be something you say, well, it's all fine and well to say make-believe helps you know reality until you consider how much it stands against reality, so, you know, shut up. But then there's one more response, a response that we'd want to bring into this, a response where we begin to get a little bit deeper into this. We pull out the big philosophical guns, and we ask a doozy of a question, a classical question. What exactly do we mean by real? This is, not surprisingly, a notoriously difficult question to respond to. Uh, the great and eminent philosopher Lily Tomlin, who also did a little bit of comedy on the side, <laughs> um, was famously quoted as saying that reality is just a collective hunch. And I'll tell you, I don't know that that's necessarily such a bad way of talking about it. It does kind of make some sense, you know. It does, there is a certain way where, well, how else are we going to get here? What more are we going to be able to say with this? I don't, I'm not sure what we can do with this. But... If we're going to look into the philosoph philosophical dimensions of this, one of the things that we want to be able to do is we want to be able to not just make uh, clever and oblique re remarks about, about, uh, about the real. We want to look at the reasons why it stands as it does. And I think that there are at least three reasons that we can see that that asking this question, what exactly is meant by the term real, is as tough as it is. But there are questions that if we begin, or reasons that if we begin to look at a little bit, it's gonna help us, I think, come around to the make-believe part. So, why exactly is asking what do we mean by the real so tough? Well, the first is probably pretty obvious, which is, it is a deep question. And when I say a deep question, what I mean by deep is I mean everything else rests upon it. You know, you can take a porch light, a lava lamp, a speck of dust from Afghanistan, the thought of a child who lived in Mozambique in 1731, uh, a number, it's 274.3, 
And you can take all of these things together and you can just keep going and going and going and going and going. And you could ask the question, what do they all have in common? And I don't care how long you go and how much you add and how many strange esoteric things you add, there is one thing they all have in common. They're all real. That's how deep real is. And that consequently, when you ask, what do we mean by real, you have to bring that kind of depth to it. That's the first reason why it's hard. There's a second reason why it's hard. It has to do with what we would call the recursive quality of the real. Now, recursive means turning back on itself. And um, what I mean by that is to say that when we try to define what we mean by real, the way that we have to define it is by getting it to refer back to itself. It becomes what we call in logic a tautology, a self-defining statement. Now, normally, when you hear something like this, when someone tries to define a position by getting it to refer to itself, you go, ah, bah. Maybe, I don't know if you do bah, but I would. But you, what you do is you go, you, I forget this. It's circular. It's not proving anything. It's not showing anything. It's not legitimate. And rightly so. You're not learning anything new from it if you, with most circular arguments. But this reality, this is different. It's different for the, for the reason that we were just talking about before. It's because everything rests upon what's real. And so, far from being absurd, by necessity, by necessity, you have to have a way in which the real defines itself. It creates a paradox with something like this. So this is another reason why asking what is real is so difficult. Because you end up getting paradoxes when you try to define it. And there's one more reason. Um, one that perhaps the philosophers have spent even more ink on than, than the other two put together. And that is that the term real in different languages, it's not used in one singular way. It's used in a lot of different ways. It is what we might call a chimera. Reality is a chimera. Grrr. That's, that's a heck of a chimera. <laughs> that's, that's a great selection. I, I uh, yeah. Chimera, everyone. Um, it's a chimera. A chimera is a monster made of incongruous parts. In yeah, it is. It's a, it's a nice illustration of incongruous parts right there. But, but it's, this is what a, what, a, what a chimera is. It's a, it's a monster made of incongruous parts. Reality, because it's defined in these different ways, is a definition, a monstrous definition, of incongruous parts. So these three reasons, the depth of what we mean by the real, the recursive character of what we mean by the real, and the different ways we use the term reality when we're trying to talk about it, all work together. They all work together to make the meaning of the real so very, very mysterious, so very, very elusive. Is that where we have to stop? Is that all we can say about it? No, we can even go a little further. We can even get a little deeper into what we mean by real in a way that I think would be helpful for talking about make-believe. Because we can talk about some of the specific ways that this term real is used in relation to this third idea. Um, there are, again, it's, it's something that people spend a lot of time on, but uh, some people make careers out of it, surprisingly. But I think if, if I were to try to lump these things together, you could probably find at least three general ways that you can talk about what is meant by real. When we use the word, that's real, three broad categories of it. The first is what I would call the existential use of real. We use the term existentially. And what I mean by that is when we use the term existentially, we use it in reference to what is present or existent regarding uh, whatever condition you're dealing with. So it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, if I say, this really is Fort George, it is a real brewery. When I talk about real in that way, it's this existential use of real. 
It's a very straightforward way. It's the way that we usually use the word real. It makes a lot of sense. But it's actually got some problems with it. And the problem is when you try to get down to some of the deeper, more fundamental levels with it, it's not always consistent and it's not always coherent. Um, think about this. Think about our ability to describe objects, okay? How do we do it? Well, the way we usually do it is we go through and we try to observe specific things, colors, shapes, memories, associations, what have you. We put them together and come up with something. Sometimes we come up with objects that we've never seen before. And so we will describe them by bringing up new different things. And sometimes, because we have this capacity, we will take qualities that are associated with different objects and just put them together in a particular way, right? We'll just slapdash them together. We can make unicorns. Unicorns could exist. They don't. I'm sorry if I'm hurting anybody's feelings with that, but they don't exist. They could. Um, a mountain of solid gold could exist. It doesn't, but it could. But we could even go further than that because we could use this way that we describe things, predicates, descriptions, right? The way we, we think about what, what things are to talk about things not only that don't exist, but that couldn't exist. Consider a square circle. Now try to imagine it. You can't. There's no way you can imagine a square circle. A square circle cannot exist because a square circle is a contradiction in terms geometrically. And yet, here I am talking about it. Now, it's an empty concept. It only has reference linguistically and logically. It doesn't exist. But the fact that it has reference linguistically and logically, you know what that means? There is some aspect of it that's real. And because of that, the existential way of talking about the real isn't entirely consistent, at least not at the deep levels that we need it to be. Again, it works for talking about, you know, beer and things like that, but, but when, we, when we try to get to these deeper levels, we run into problems. Fortunately, it's not the only way we use the term real. There's a second way that we talk about the word real, um, what I call the pragmatic approach to it. And <clears throat> by pragmatically speaking about the term real, I mean it's when we use it in reference to the forces or causes at work in an object or condition or event. So politics is really an exercise in power or success is really just showing up at the right time. Oh, that's a great picture. Success. <laughs> That was my Borat right there. But, but it, it, in this particular case, when you're talking about real, when you're saying something is, really is the case, you're, you're saying what it really is is the forces at work that make it possible for such and such a condition to arise, right? These, these are the ways, the, another way of talking about this. Now, this doesn't necessarily run into all the pitfalls that you get with the existential approach, but it does have its own problems. And most notably, it is not always meaningful. It's not always meaningful. It's not always meaningful because we don't know fundamentally what these forces or causes are that we're saying the reality of the situation are. In fact, we don't know fundamentally, and I do mean this fundamentally is key here, we don't know fundamentally whether there are forces or causes at work at all. What do I mean? Let me pull another philosopher out of my back pocket here. A guy named uh, David Hume. Some of you probably have heard of David Hume before. I actually was just talking to my class today about David Hume. We were introducing him. David Hume, who, by the way, you know, if you ever want a philosopher who you could just sort of have a, a crush on and wish he is your favorite uncle or something like that, David Hume is the guy. He's fantastic. He used to wear a turban. He's really fat. He was really happy. Just great. He would, he would love it at Fort George. Fantastic human being. Really good guy. But one of the things that uh, um, David Hume is famous for is 
talking about how little we can actually assert the reality of causality at all. And I don't just mean specific causes, like this cause or that cause. I mean that there is such a thing in the universe as cause. He'll say, oh, well, it seems as though there's cause, but if we break down what it is, he says, well, really it amounts to a matter of habit, a, a series of associations that we get in the habit of putting together with regard to events and saying that's what we have. How so? Famously, he illustrates, he has a lot of famous illustrations with this, but one of them is with playing billiards. He was Scottish, so it's not pool, it's billiards. So, um, that was my billiards shot. Um, so, he says, I'm, play I'm playing billiards at a pub much like Fort George, and I hit the cue ball. And the cue ball goes and it hits another ball. Now, when I play billiards, my whole plan about playing billiards is that I intend to use the cue ball to hit the other ball and it's supposed to have a chain reaction, a series of cause and effect. This is what, this is the basis of the game. And I've got enough confidence in this, I've got enough belief in this that I've established really over my whole lifetime to, amongst other things, commit to playing billiards um, in this, uh, on this table. And yet, if I ask myself, well, how precisely do I know this? How is it that I came to know that there would be this thing called cause and effect? What was, what was the material that went into my mind that allowed me to know this or that seems to allow anybody to know this? What do you look at? You look at your experiences, your flawed, narrow, short, ignorant experiences, your perspective on the world. I mean, think, think about just looking out here right now, okay? You say, oh, well, I know where I am. I can tell because I'm looking around. Okay, because you can see things, and you're seeing it from a point of view. And you would say, oh, it's so obvious. We can, we can affirm that very easily. And yet, what are you seeing? You're seeing, of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, you're seeing this one little swath, right? And you're seeing it from a point of view, in time, in space, through habits, and that you're, it's this, this sliver upon a sliver upon a sliver upon a sliver upon a sliver of possibilities, a sliver so small, you don't even know how big it, it is and, or how small it is in relation to all the other possibilities because you don't even have access to the possibilities. And yet from that, Hume says, you are going to establish that there is this universal condition called, called causality that makes it possible for things to happen in the world. My friend, that is not the world, that is you. That is your habits, that is your thinking, and it is not to say that it is wrong, perhaps it is correct, perhaps, but it's here, not there. Now you can see from that how we get to a problem when we try to say something as fundamental as causality is really that fundamental, that it's all up here, and it doesn't seem to have any way to get out of it. So, so much for this pragmatic approach. There might be one more approach too. There might be one other way of talking about the real. What I call the metaphysical. And the metaphysical here is in reference to the idea that when we use the word real, we're referring to a grounding or governing or defining condition of a thing. So, this, this use is usually used for Philosophical big ticket items. Uh, the ethical rule, ethical rules that human beings have are really a part of humanity's search for meaning. Really a part of humanity's search for meaning. The universe is really an extension of God's will, right? Those kinds of statements, when you use that, you're using the word real in a metaphysical way, as opposed to merely an existential or merely a pragmatic way, although it does have elements of those. <clears throat> What's the problem with this? Well, the problem with metaphysical use is because it seeks to reduce the reality of anything to something deeper. And we've already had a brief look of how tricky the depths of things can get. It inevitably ends up in mystery and consequently sucks as an explanation. 
It's not, again, that it's necessarily wrong. It's that it doesn't actually tell you anything. It doesn't actually show you anything. It leaves you in this swooning sense of the sublime, and, you know, that's awesome, <laughs> but it's not actually helping with knowledge. So, it seems then that when we try to say that the real is anything, here's what we can do. We can say that the real is that which is crucial to the being of the thing in question, being as it is, however that may be. That's about what we can say. And if you say to that, well, geez, that's really not much of a description. I mean, you're, you're just kind of saying, well, the real is sort of, when you use it really, it means it's really important. I would say, yeah, I entirely agree with you. It's not saying much, but that is the point, right? Trying to talk about reality, what reality is, if we take it seriously, defies the capacity to go beyond the superficial. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why we begin to have trouble in the way that we treat it with regard to make-believe. So what we're left with is a situation where reality is not graspable. And maybe we could just leave it at that, but it's also, as you've probably noticed in your life, not escapable either. <laughs> we have these two forces together in this. Um, let me give you an exa few examples of this. Maybe, maybe the world is ultimately material, as it seems. It seems like the world's material. But we cannot know this at least we can't know it as an actuality, and yet we must deal with it. Maybe the world exists, uh, or maybe the events of the world occur because of causes or forces, the way it seems. But we can't know this. We can't know its actuality, and yet we still have to deal with it. Maybe the universe is a grand cosmic order or consciousness or creation as it can seem. But we cannot know this. We cannot account for its actuality, even though we must deal with it. So this is where we are. It seems that way, but we cannot know it. We cannot, and this word I'm using, I'm using it specifically, we cannot encounter its actuality. And yet, we must deal with it. What shall we do? Well, this, this is where the word make-believe comes back in, right? Because it's in this strange situation where we find the reality of reality <laughs> um, where make-believe comes in to play a role with the real. Now, I should say this. It's not entirely clear what make-believe means either. Um, its scope is, rests within the realm of imagination. Imagination is almost notoriously as difficult to define as, as reality. But, but we can generally define it as treating as though it is real. So make-believe is treating as though it is real. Or, if I were to put it in a little more technical language, treating as though X is crucial to the being of a thing being as it is, however that may be. <laughs> really rolls off the tongue, I think. Uh, we'll say treating as though it's real. We need make-believe, though, and we need make-believe to deal with the open-endedness of the real. We need it to act with meaning in the midst of open-endedness where we cannot ultimately see what is, we cannot ultimately see what makes, because we don't have access to causality, and we cannot ultimately see what grounds, because it ends in mystery, right? So, we need it, we need it for this open-endedness. Great, okay, 
we need it. Well, what, what's it do? How does it work? What, when we use make-believe, when we, when we treat things as though, how does it help us with this mysterious abyss called reality, which we try to pretend is not there, which we try to pretend is simple, which we try to pretend can be reduced to the actual and yet cannot? How does it help us with that? Well, in a couple ways. The first way, it liberates us from the tyranny of the literal. Make-believe liberates us from the tyranny of the literal. Let me tell you what I mean by this. There's an unfortunate feature in our culture, and I, I think it probably even extends beyond our culture, but I certainly know it extends in our culture, the modern world, where we tend to make literal be equivalent to actual. We say if something is literally true, that means it's actually true. Well, here's the thing. Literal is not actual. It's not actual because, as you might recall, we have no access to the actual. There's no way to get to the actual. That was the whole problem with, with this reel. No, that's not what the literal is. You know what the literal is? The literal is our treatment of unreflected immediate experiences of the things that we see and taste and touch and hear and smell and encounter and just right there, unreflectively, and then treating them as though they are actual because we don't reflect on it. That's what the literal is, right? Which, by the way, I would like to point out that when you talk about something as literal, because you're treating it as though it is actual, what are you doing? You're doing some make-believe, my friends. That's what you're doing. You, tell, you say that something is literal, you are acting with make-believe. I should drop the mic for that. But um, the literal is not necessarily tyrannical, right? The, the, there are plenty of times where I do, and we do, want to talk about literal things, right? It is literally very dangerous to strap a rocket to your Honda Civic and drive it in the desert with the hopes of launching over a cliff, right? That literally is dangerous. <laughs> There's no make-believe about that. Um, by the way, that's, that's a Darwin Award uh, double winner right there. But, um, uh, you know, this is, this is something that we, we, uh, we want to be able to talk about things. There's plenty of things that we want to talk about literally, and the fact that we're talking about it literally doesn't make it tyrannical. But what does make the literal tyrannical is when we conflate the literal, when we tie the literal together with the actual. When we say that the literal is the actual. And the reason that's a kind of tyranny is because it, it's a kind of self-imposed mental poverty. It deprives us of our capacity to engage with that elusive real world. Another thing that make-believe does, probably even more important, it generates the possibility for action in the real world. Make-believe generates the possibility for pretending, treating, regarding something as present, even if it is counterfactual. Think of a toy. Think of an invisible friend. Think of something that seems to go counter to these things. And think about what these do, how they allow us to experiment, how they allow us to explore, how they allow us to have some sort of ease with things, how they allow us to solve all sorts of different problems. This is one thing, one possibility that is generated by it. Think about how make-believe makes something causally significant, though other forces or causes may be taken to be at work. Consider a hypothesis in science where I suppose something may, in fact, be a case, even though I don't necessarily have proof of it. I suppose maybe even more conjecture might even be a better example of it. Or consider magic and the idea of magic. The idea that we could account for something in this way, that we could make believe it works as though, 
and what this allows for. And make-believe allows for us to consider the world in terms of a larger part of reality, though we don't necessarily have access to it. Consider a theory, a new theory, where we think about an entirely new world. Consider an axiom, a basis upon which some sort of set of actions or activities proceed mathematically or scientifically. Consider a miracle, a transformation that we observe, that we account for in, in some fashion that transcends all sorts of other fashions. All of these, I would say, are a kind of make-believe, or more specifically, they depend upon the capacity for make-believe. They depend upon the capacity for us to treat as though that we don't have access to. And if we didn't have that capacity, if our mind didn't move that way, none of these things, from miracles to axioms, the toys and invisible friends, <laughs> and everything in between, would be possible. Now, it is true, I suppose, that all of these are illusions. Everything that I've talked about, all of this make-believe that I've talked about are illusions. They are the illusions that we cast upon the inescapable but unreachable canvas of the actual the world, the real world that's out there. But there is something that I think is very important to realize about this, and again, it has to do with the whole tyranny of the, of the literal again. The fact that something is an illusion does not make it false. It does not make it false. An illusion here is something that's generated by the mind's self-referential activity. That's all that it is. It's the mind working together and making something seem real in such a fashion that as it's conscribed and put together in a particular way. In this sense, the colors that you see around you, the sound that you're hearing right now, the, the weight that you feel on your body, the perceptions that you have of the world, these are illusions. They're generated by the activity of the mind. They are not real in themselves, but they are fundamental to our encounter of the world. They, I mean, I, and when I say fundamental, I mean fundamental. How would you begin to encounter the world? What would you even begin to talk about if you did not have this kind of make-believe? This allows us to begin to move towards this, right? All perceptions are necessarily illusions. And as you can see, this is extremely useful, right? Because it makes it possible to weave narratives, narratives that give explanations of values, of meaning, of truths, of all these different things. In essence, this thing called culture, with all of its fruits, with language and values and habits and religions and objects and a, and a history and prospects and everything else, depends upon illusions. We are creatures of illusion. We depend upon it. It is our natural adaptation to this reality that we don't have access to. Perhaps part of the reason why we're so succumbed to the idea that there is an actual that we just have that must be an illusion is precisely because we are such creatures of illusion. But to be conscious of that, to be conscious of that make-believe, to be conscious of that way, this is how we come to be conscious of ourselves. This is how we come to have some fundamental sense, and I would begin to say, some kind of freedom of what we are. Now, does that mean that there's no possible way to be wrong or mistaken or anything else like this? I mean, after all, if everything that we know and think about the world amounts to a kind of make-believe, it does seem to suggest in a way that, that well, then everything is just, you know, the measure of whatever you happen to make-believe. You got a problem with it? Ah, well, pretend it's different. <laughs> Off you go. Um, that, that's not what I'm saying here. It is entirely possible to be wrong or to be mistaken, um, or more positively, it's possible to discover or learn 
in the real world with make-believe, with this view of make-believe. The thing that's different, though, is when we think about right and wrong, or mistaken and correct, or discovery, or learning, we have to realize what we are talking about. What we are talking about is workability. Workability. We're talking, or lack thereof, in the case of mistakes and so forth. So, if, for instance, make-believe is wrong about something, how can make-believe be wrong? Make-believe can be wrong when it generates a position that is fundamentally unworkable in the real world. And I do mean the real world. When I look at the delusion of an addict or the self-contradicting vitriol of bigotry and hatred, things like that, these are make-believe. They're very, they're definitely generated by the activities and illusions of ideas, but they do not work. They confound themselves through their own activity. And in that sense, in their unworkability, they're wrong. Just the same, an illusion that opens up a new world, that allows us to consider an entirely new theory or new way of being that hadn't occurred before, this this is genius, and it is not because it is actually correct or anything else. It is because it opens up new possibilities, new avenues, new ways in which the horizon of our illusions and our make-believe might proceed. So it does have a place, but the place is a place of deep workability with our encounter with the real world. So, Given the way that make-believe is real, and it's re as real as it needs to be, as I was saying with these illusions, and allows for us to work with the real world, this is why we need a few other things. First of all, I would say this is why we need art. And when I say we need art, I mean I don't mean, oh, we need art, you know, like, long live the arts, not that. I mean, we need art. I mean, it is fundamental to human beings' thinking. It is fundamental to our capacity to use this thing called make-believe to encounter the world and make meaningful and workable illusions to be able to encounter and work our way through things. We need it. Because it is through art, and I mean art in the broad sense, I don't just mean you know, uh, the painting and poetry and things like that, these are crucial, these are central to it, I would say, and actually have their own special values. They need to be lifted up and protected, but I mean it broadly. Um, art gives us a way to treat the real world more fully. We need play. And by play, I mean, I mean what Kant once called purposive purposelessness. I mean that we have to be able to act intentionally, but without any particular end that it would move toward. To act and work in a way where the activity, simply in doing what it does and acting in the way it does, generates new possibility. Why? Because by doing that, we open up these new possibilities for being. We consider these new horizons. We escape the traps that can fold in on our mind and our thinking in these particular ways. We need virtue. We need virtue to be able to, and I mean virtue in kind of a traditional sense, I mean courage, humility, patience, compassion, these sorts of things. We need virtue to be able to appreciate the world more fully, to be able to engage it, to savor it, to find places for these things within it. And finally, maybe above all others, or including all of them, we need freedom the capacity for things to, f and the allowance for things to fully be what they are. To bring these other needs of art, of play, of virtue together so that we, we as human beings, we as these minds of illusion, we as these creatures of make-believe, we can encounter the real world more fully. 
We need this make-believe and the freedom to have this make-believe to encounter this world more fully. We need all of this because the initial question, how real is make-believe, is actually backwards. I think that's actually why people had such a hard time with it in the first place. I would say it's backwards. It's backwards in its conjecture. It really ought to be framed, how do we encounter reality through make-believe? Because without make-believe, we would never encounter the real world at all. Without make-believe, we would never encounter the real world at all. Let me end with a quote by Carl Sagan that I think that sums this up. Imagination will carry, often carry us to worlds that never were. But without it, we go nowhere. This, I think, speaks to the significance of make-believe in relation to the real. Thank you. Are there uh, are there any questions?